Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We'll be proceeding shortly with uh, the second lecture in stream two. Just give us a second to install everything. This Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Also, da können wir noch richtig. Yes. That's very kind. Thank you for the feedback. So I just wanted to let you know that we're setting up the stream and we'll begin within the five minutes. If this is in our possibility, please give us this time. We're very sorry. Um, our lecturer has already joined the meeting and we'll be beginning shortly with the PowerPoint. Um, though, though I'll start the screen sharing first. Uh, Dr. Professor Law, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I just interrupted your screen share. Uh, Dr. Law, if you can hear me, you can just mute yourself and uh, talk to the crowd really quickly to make sure everything is working well. Excuse me, Dr. Law, I cannot hear you. I'm very sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, that's perfect, yes. Thank you very much. So um, I will start with a short introduction and an overview of the program. You can mute yourself and then start screen sharing once I tell you, then you can proceed with the lecture. Is this okay for you? That's fine. I will have to get to the beginning of the presentation. You have to put up with the, that at the beginning. It's okay. It should be okay. Thank you very much. Dear participants, we hope you had a wonderful lunch and can enjoy the break. Um, and that you're ready for some more content on sexual health, because yes, we do have some more interesting content and things to share with you, to talk about. First things first, however, I'd like to give you an overview of the afternoon, just to clear things up. So now, two streams are running in parallel. You can find them on our website. Stream one currently is streaming the lecture on sexual therapy. Stream two, which you're in now, is streaming STS. If you wish to switch the stream, just go on our website. There you will find the links for the YouTube streams. After this lecture, after this round of lectures, we'll be having project fair taking place on WonderMe. This is a more interactive part of the SMSC and you can be there talking to the project presenters from the morning. Make sure to not miss this interesting part to get a little bit more insight into the students of projects. After uh, this little, little um, session on Wonder Me, we'll be having two rounds of workshops taking place each for one hour. You have signed up for those workshops if you have, um, and registration is mandatory. After each workshop, there's a break of 15 minutes. We'll all rejoin together at 5.45 for the closing ceremony and a surprise you should not miss. Do you know how lesbians should protect themselves from STIs? Have you already asked yourself whether the prevalence of STIs has been changed by the lockdown? STIs may or may not be the first thing that comes to your mind when you talk about sexual health. And still nowadays and throughout history, the topic has been a taboo theme and one might get a little uncomfortable talking about it. This is why we're here today. As a professor for epidemiology and public health, at the University of Bern, Professor Dr. Nicola Law will be presenting this topic to you. Would like to welcome her in our stream. Dr. Law, I will quit the screen sharing now and you can start with your presentation. Just to inform everyone, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll collect them and moderate a discussion at the end of the lecture. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. 
I'm very pleased to be with you all this afternoon. Oops, now that was supposed to go back to the beginning. Okay, here we are at the beginning. So uh, I'd like to give, um, do a brief introduction of myself first. And then I want to uh, give you an overview, really, a very brief overview about sexually transmitted infections and sexual behavior. But I thought you might be interested to hear how I got into sexually transmitted infections. And really, because I was a medical student in London uh, from 1981 to 1987. And you may know that in 1981 was the first year that cases of AIDS were described in San Francisco. So during my medical school career, a HIV and AIDS became increasingly uh, um, sort of talked about as a topic and I got involved in some uh, student groups talking about sexual health and joining a charity called the Terence Higgins Trust which was to provide support uh, to people with AIDS and uh, then I chose as um, one of my first jobs to do a job in the central London clinic the James Pringle House uh, in what's called genitourinary medicine. And then I just decided that that was what I wanted to do. I just had a real passion for it. The people that I met were the nicest people uh, I had met so far. The stories and the history taking in sexual health is just incomparable. It's the most interesting history you'll ever take from anyone. And I just decided that that would be my career. So I carried on. I did all of the training necessary to become accredited in genitourinary medicine. So in the UK, that is a specialty. Sexually transmitted infections and HIV is an actual clinical specialty. Uh, and then to be able to do uh, research, I did a master's degree in communicable disease epidemiology, and then I did further training in public health. So I've been in Switzerland now for 20 years and, uh, and have been working, leading a sexual and reproductive health research group at the University of Bern. And during my career, I've also, I'm also an active participant in publishing as a deputy editor of one of the journals, Sexually Transmitted Infections, and I'm also a secretary of the International Society for STD Research. So I think you can see from that is that uh, I'm totally uh, committed and enthused by sexually transmitted infections, and I hope that this talk will help you to get interested too. The picture you see on the right is from a TV series called It's a Sin. Uh, this is a series that on, on Channel 4, UK Channel 4, uh, I don't know if you can stream it, but if you want to know what it was like for me as a medical student in London in the 1980s, you really, really should watch this series. It's fantastic. So, what I'm going to talk to you about is I'm going to talk about sexually transmitted infections. I'm also going to talk about what we call sexually transmissible infections, meaning pathogens that can be transmitted through sexual intercourse, but that is not necessarily the only route of infection. I'm going to start off, sort of orientate you about understanding more about sexually transmitted infections by talking about the behaviours that uh, make STIs more likely. And then we will run through some of the main uh, STI presentations. Uh, and I'll finish up with a little bit about STI prevention and then finally what um, COVID has, has done to our sex lives and STIs. So here is a long list that you don't need to read, except to know that there are more than 30 sexually transmissible viruses, bacteria, and parasites, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. One, the way that I'm going to do this is by talking about them the way that they present as syndromes. So really, if you're a clinician and you, you have someone who's sitting in front of you, or in fact, if you experience symptoms of, of a sexually transmitted infection, 
you're not going to go by the pathogen. You're going to experience or you're going to see or you're going to hear about someone who has a syndrome. And we split those syndromes up largely into those that uh, result in genital discharges, those that cause ulcers, things that cause lumps, things that make you itch, and things that are really uh, systemic uh, illnesses. And what I'm going to what I want you to notice here in the list that I've given you is some things appear only in one category, for example, these infections that cause discharges, but some of them, particularly uh, syphilis and HIV, appear in multiple categories, and that's because they have multiple clinical manifestations. And these are infections that you really need to think about. Doesn't matter whether you decide to do sexually transmitted infections as a specialty or not. HIV and syphilis have clinical manifestations that occur in all clinical specialties. So you really need to be aware of those. Just before going into more detail, I want you to know how very, very common uh, sexually transmitted infections are. So the World Health Organization estimates, does an estimation exercise every four to five years, and I'm involved in the group that does these estimates. The most recent ones we have done were for 2016. We're actually updating those now. Uh, and these are for four curable sexually transmitted infections, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and trichomoniasis. We estimate there are 376 million new cases of these infections every year. That means more than a million new cases of one of these curable infections every day. But what you can also see is here we are in Europe, and here Europe includes Russia and goes across the whole of Europe, 23 million in Europe. That is by not the majority by any means. The vast majority of these infections are in, oops, in low and middle income countries. And so what I want you to look at here is here we are in high income Switzerland, and each of these bars is one of the infections, chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomoniasis, and syphilis. And on the top panel are those that are in women, and on the bottom panel, those that are in men. And what you will see is that in the low and the lower middle income countries, particularly in women, these infections are more common they are, than they are in the high income countries. You can look at the differences by the infection. So you can see that trichomoniasis, actually, I'm not going to talk about this today because it's not very common in um, uh, Switzerland, uh, is the most commonly diagnosed uh, sexually transmitted infection in women. What you, and what you can also see then is that syphilis is generally the least common. And what you can also see is that an infection like chlamydia seems to be reasonably common in a worldwide. And we'll come to some of the reasons for that. So let's move on now. Let's talk about, as I said, understanding sexual behavior and sexual networks as a means to understanding uh, STI transmission. Now, this is a, uh, a figure that you may have seen if you've done uh, infectious disease pathogenesis. There are, for any infection, not just for sexually transmitted infections, if you want to think about who gets infections, how common they are, you have to look at three different points of view. You have to look at the pathogen itself. Characteristics of the pathogen are how, how transmissible it is, how easily it can be transmitted, how long the infection lasts, and how virulent it is, how, how sick does it make you. What you may uh, see is when I'm talking about sexually transmitted infections in this triangle, probably a lot of what you've heard about COVID, about SARS-CoV-2, this all fits into this paradigm as well. So you can think about transmissibility, persistence and virulence for any pathogen. And a lot of the differences between 
the levels of these infections that we get are actually qualities, characteristics of the pathogen themselves. Then we have to look at uh, the, well, actually one thing that we will come to in terms, particularly for bacterial infections, is resistance, resistance to the treatments that we have developed to combat these. Then there are factors in our environment that affect whether you're likely to get a sexually transmitted infection. That is exactly things like the high, low, middle income uh, country setting. Those are structural determinants, economic determinants about how likely we are to get sick. So whilst in Switzerland, we talk about its STIs being very common, you will have seen that there are countries with different socioeconomic conditions in which they're much more common. Now, the final thing is about the who, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. That's us. And us in terms of our behaviours, what our sexual practices, what we actually do, and our own immune systems about whether we are likely, whether we have an infection for life, as you would do with a viral infection, or uh, we recover from those and can be infected uh, again, as is typical with bacterial infections. So let's move on. A particular paradigm or way of thinking about sexually transmitted infections and the behaves that spread them spread them are to think about what are called core groups so what you can see here are three levels here the general population that's everyone then right in the middle we have something called a core group and then in between, we have something called a bridging population. So the core group is a group of people. It's not a single group of people because it can differ according to the infection and the setting, but a group of people who have a disproportionately high level of sexually transmitted infections in relation to the size of that population. So this is a group that contributes disproportionately to transmission. And then there are, when you choose sexual partners, you often, you don't choose your sexual partner by saying, are you in a core group or are you not in a core group? You have your sexual uh, partners and there are people who will be in the general population, but they're mixing with people who are in the core group, and those are generally called bridging populations. And these mi mixtures between different uh, groups of populations end up being what spreads infections between one group and another. But people within core groups are more likely to have sex with each other than they are to have sex with people outside the core group. And that's what we call an assortative pattern of sexual mixing. So let's just apply this to some particular groups. What we know is that you, young adults, are the people who have the highest rates of sexual partner change uh, amongst the general population. So if you're having unprotected sex, that's condomless sex, uh, it means that you are vulnerable, you're susceptible to sexually transmitted infections and to passing them on. So if young people mixing amongst themselves and having condomless sex are likely to be spreading uh, uh, STIs amongst themselves. Some young people, younger women in particular, are more likely to have sex with older men. You can then say those young women are a bridging population with the general population and they then sexually transmitted infections are spreading between these populations. Other groups that tend to have higher rates of sexual partner change than the general population are men who have sex with men and sex workers and their clients. And we will, as we'll see, sexually transmitted infections are higher in these groups. And then it isn't necessarily just who you are, this moves into the socioeconomic determinants of health. There are places there in which the prevalence of sexually transmitted infections is higher than in others. And some groups 
who are likely also to be geographically clustered. So you could say a geographical cluster, a large geographical cluster might be low income countries. But within those countries and within high income countries, there are areas geographic areas and they tend to be more socioeconomically deprived uh, and have higher levels of STIs and there are many reasons for that and a particular group in high income countries that seems to be more affected by STIs than others are some black minority ethnic groups where I come from in the UK it's particularly amongst those with Caribbean origins and partly because of assortative mixing the fact that you you actually you will notice you tend to choose sexual partners who are more like you than unlike you. Once you have a high prevalence of an infection within a core group, it will stay within and continue to circulate in that group. And then you have uh, spreading between the group and the general population through bridging population. So these are people who have different types of sexual partners. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about uh, how the levels of sexually transmitted infections vary between different groups of people. So here is, oops, here is one example of a what would be called a core group. As I said, men who have sex with men, shortened to MSM. And these are data that come from England. And they are showing over years for different uh, kinds of sexually transmitted infections, the percentage of all infections diagnosed in sexual health clinics that are, are amongst MSM. Now, if you just bear in mind that men who have sex with men are two to three percent of the sexually active male population. So if you have an infection that 80 percent of all of that infection is occurring in a group that is two to three percent of the male population, then that is clearly a disproportionate um, amount of that infection. So syphilis and gonorrhea particularly are disproportionately high amongst men who have sex with men. All of the other uh, these sexually transmitted infections in this picture are also higher in MSM chlamydia, uh, anogenital warts, genital warts and herpes, but at much lower levels. So they are more common than in the general population, but not as disproportionately common as gonorrhea and syphilis. So I thought that I would deal with this, uh, the question that came up in the introduction about lesbians because they are a same sex uh, population group. But of course, uh, lesbians are well, not of course, but lesbians are not a core group for sexually transmitted infections. Part of the reason they are not a core group for sexually transmitted infections is because the type of sexual intercourse that women have between themselves does not involve penetration in the same way. We're go I'm going to come on to, to talk exactly about the anatomy, but if you know that uh, that th if the penetrative sex that lesbians have comes either from insertion of fingers or sex toys or oral sex, but does not in, involve intercourse between the main location of where a sexually transmitted infection is. So generally, you're going to get indirect uh, transmission of a sexually transmitted uh, pathogen between women. But Whilst many women who uh, have sex with women assume that they are not at risk of uh, sexually transmitted infections, of course, they can get infections from their female partners. They, they can, uh, through these routes, they ha may have female partners who also have sex with men. And they may also themselves have, have had previous male sex, sex partners. So where you have infections, viral infections that are lifelong and persist or are recurrent, then someone who had male sexual partners early on in her sexual career, for example, human papillomavirus and herpes simplex, may continue to get those infections and consequences of those. The other infection that I want to draw yourself, you, you to, is 
called bacterial vaginosis. Now, this is an imbalance in bacteria that normally live in, in the vagina and the, the balance gets distorted, so it causes an abnormally smelly discharge. This is a, uh, an infection, it turns out, uh, is particularly common between women who have sex with women. And what you can show is here we're showing something that is appears to be sexually transmissible rather than sexually transmitted. It's not a classical sexually transmitted infection. What you can show, if you do gene sequencing on vaginal discharge from women who have sex with women, you sequence all of the bacteria that they have in their vagina. And everyone has a, uh, a unique uh, genetic signature in their vaginal, what's called their microbiota. But if you look at couples and you do gene sequencing of vaginal discharge in couples of women, then you find out that they actually have very similar um, microbiota, much more similar than two women who are not having sex, sex with each other. So this sh shows that there is something that is happening during sexual practices between um, uh, women having sex with women that is ending up sh with them sharing uh, the vaginal microbial environment. Now, how do you prevent uh, STIs uh, amongst uh, lesbians? So if you are talking about HPV, human papillomavirus, then we're going to come on to this at the end. But briefly, then vaccination is the way to prevent uh, the consequences of, of human papillomavirus infection. And HSV, as I will talk about, uh, prevention of that is really about being open with your sexual partners about the infections that you do have uh, and knowing that your partner has uh, herpes means that when they have a herpes attack then you can either not have sex or you can have protected sex. This is an extremely good review by uh, Jeannie Marazzo who is a uh, uh, um, probably the most famous uh, physician, STI physician, for her work on sex uh, STIs in uh, amongst, uh, between women who have sex with women. Right, moving on. Now I said, let's go into these uh, STIs according to the way that they uh, present. And we're going to run through some of the infections that present with discharge. Here, I've listed them again. Here I have put candida and bacterial vaginosis in grey because I'm not going to talk to them about them further because they are not classically sexually transmitted. As I said, I'm also not going to talk about uh, trichomonas uh, because it has fewer long-term consequences. But what you can see is that amongst women, if you have a vaginal discharge, this discharge can come be made from a condition in your vagina, or it can come from an infection that affects the endocervical canal. Okay. Now, just remember also that vaginal discharge in women is usually completely normal, whereas a urethral discharge in a man is not normal and is a sign of an infection. Uh, particularly when it's accompanied by uh, the dysuria, discomfort in, in the urethra. But these infections, these three infections, chlamydia, gonorrhea, mycoplasma genitalium, are generally purely sexually transmitted infections. They live and they multiply in the woman, in the endocervix, and in the male urethra. And they are transmitted through male penetration of the vagina. So you can see that if there is chlamydia, gonorrhea, or M genitalium in the male urethra, when the man ejaculates, that is going to go, it is going to go into the vagina, but it's getting into the columnar epithelium of the endocervix, which is going to establish the infection. And then you will see that if you are a woman, and the infection does not get treated and does not resolve spontaneously. It can go up and get into the fallopian tubes. So we'll talk about some of the complications. So now I want to talk about something briefly about, is it really about how our understanding of these infections uh, came about historically. Historically, uh, the first uh, 
infection causing discharge that we became aware of was gonorrhea. That's because it causes a particularly purulent discharge in men, so you would notice it. Uh, and when microscopy became available in the 19th century, you could see on a gram stain that in this polymorphonuclear leukocyte, you have what are called gram negative, they stain gram negative diplococci, and they fill up these polymorphonuclear leukocytes. So you had a really good diagnostic test for gonorrhea. And so you could say that gonorrhea caused urethritis. So gonorrhea caused by a uh, nares area uh, gonorrhea. What it then turned out that was that when you treat the men who have uh, gonococcal urethritis, you will have a proportion of those men who don't get treated, who don't recover, and they present with urethr urethritis that was originally called non-gonococcal urethritis. And that was because at the time and until the 1970s, we had not discovered chlamydia. So everything that was not gonorrhea was non-gonococcal urethritis. Then we, we discover chlamydia is a cause of urethritis. But then when we treat the people who have uh, chlamydial urethritis, there's another proportion that doesn't recover. And it turns out, well, what we call them, because we don't have another name for them, is non-gonococcal, non-chlamydial urethritis. And then in the 1980s, but not really recognized until the last 10 years, another organism, Mycoplasma genitalium, uh, has been discovered as another cause of urethritis. And then there are some men who still don't recover. And those will be the ones with, this isn't yet a name, but I assure you it will become a condition, non-gonococcal, non-chlamydial, non-mycoplasmal urethritis. So let's, let's go on a little bit with those uh, into a little bit more detail. Firstly, about chlamydia. Uh, really, um, uh, one of my favorite, well, I think it's my favorite uh, STI. It's the most commonly diagnosed bacterial sexually transmitted infection in high income countries where we have access to good diagnostics. As I said, it was recognized as a sexually transmitted infection in the 1970s. The actual uh, bacterium, Chlamydia trachomatis, was identified long before that, but there was no way of culturing it uh, and therefore in, um, it investigating it further until the 1970s. But it actually wasn't until the, until the 1990s that it became possible to test for it widely. So this is when it becomes much more widely recognized uh, as a cause of sexually transmitted infection and, and in need of treatment. As you've seen in men, it's a cause of non-specific urethritis. The most common clinical presentation is as urethral discharge and dysuria when it presents with symptoms. But it is often asymptomatic in men. We are increasingly recognizing. In women, most of these infections are in fact asymptomatic, actually don't cause any symptoms at all. And the reason for that is that you've just seen that when they infect the endocervix, which is at the top of your vagina, if there is, even if there is discharge, unless there is a lot of discharge and it comes to the external enteritis, you're not going to notice it. So most of these infections are actually asymptomatic in women. When they do cause uh, problems, they mainly present as discharge. But if you have inflammation on your cervix, they can also cause postcoital bleeding. So that's bleeding after having sex or sex that occurs in between a period. Uh, if you're pregnant and you, you can transmit chlamydia to your uh, newborn baby, resulting in ophthalmia neonatorum, so eye infections, and a pneumonitis, an atypical pneumonia. And the diagnosis rate depends very much uh, on whether you test people for it or not, because if you're testing people, if you have people who don't have symptoms and you don't test them, then you won't find the infection. What it turns out is that if you test a general population, about three to 5% of 15 to 24 year olds, the youngest, most sexually active um, age group will have chlamydia trachomatis detected. Easily treatable with doxycycline, a tetracycline for a week. And I put another antibiotic here, azithromycin, a single one gram dose uh, as an alternative treatment. And I will explain to you when I come to 
mycoplasma genitalium, why this is now an alternative treatment and not the primary treatment, even though a single one gram dose of a tablet seems much is much easier to take than a one week course. Then, of course, with all sexually transmitted infections, you need to do contact tracing to find and treat the partners. So chlamydia, as I showed you when it gets in, up into the upper genital tract, gets into the upper genital tract of men too, where it causes epididymoocytis, which can be an intensely painful uh, um, swollen testicle, but actually is much less common uh, than is pelvic inflammatory disease in women. So here, if we look at chlamydia infection, the, this is what can happen if you're a woman and you get chlamydia. Pelvic inflammatory disease, if it gets into your fallopian tubes, if it heals by scarring, uh, you can get tubal scarring, which it strips away the cilia in your fallopian tubes, can either result in infertility because you cannot, an egg can't get from the ovary into the uterus, or if the egg sticks in the fallopian tube because it doesn't get into the uterus and gets fertilized there, it causes an ectopic pregnancy. And the ectopic pregnancy can only be resolved surgically because otherwise it uh, bursts because of restricted space, results in hemorrhage and, 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 you, and is fatal. So ectopic pregnancies are rare, but they get diagnosed. What you also have if you've had tubal pathology and it's caused adhesions in particular in the pelvis is chronic pelvic pain. But all of these manifestations, actually the most likely outcome is that they resolve on their own. So even if you have chlamydia, it's likely to resolve on its own. If it results in pelvic inflammatory disease, that can resolve without treatment. And even most tubal pathology resolves on its own. What is in and here are the pregnancy outcomes. What is important about chlamydia and the other bacterial infections is that once you've treated them with antibiotics, you are then susceptible again. So if you have se unprotected sex, condomless sex, get chlamydia, get diagnosed, get treated for it, you are immediately susceptible again. And so it's this recurrent patterns of uh, bacterial sexually transmitted infections that keep them uh, being common and keep them in circulation, resulting in ongoing transmission. What you do about it uh, is that in high income countries, people have just tended to apply uh, diagnostic tests to young people in general and young people who are asymptomatic. And this is, called, this is what's called screening if you apply it very widely done in several high income countries with the aim of reducing transmission on in the population to reduce incidence and prevalence and to reduce the upper genital tract complications. What it turns out in practice is screening is just much harder to do than it sounds on paper. And we see little impact on prevalence, probably because of the recurrence and the ongoing transmission. But we do see some reduction in pelvic inflammatory disease. OK. Gonorrhea, back to gonorrhea, because that was the first bacterial cause of urethritis and cervicitis that we found. Here is Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. So he was the person who discovered first that here you have the gonococcus on this plate uh, where penicillin is embedded into the culture medium. And where you see no growth, all of these uh, strips were a of were streaked out um, pure cultures of these organisms. And where there is what's called this zone of inhibition means that the penicillin has killed here the gonococcus. So here, finally, in the 1940s, we had a treatment that was effective against uh, penicillin and actually extremely highly effective, gets rid of it and kills it in four hours. So really highly effective treatment with initially with penicillin. Here, here you can see now you've got uh, clinical manifestations of a purulent urethritis in the male urethra and here a, a, a speculum examination of the cervix where you see an inflamed cervix and here a mucopurulent discharge looking similar to the one that comes out of the male urethra uh, in the female cervix but causing no symptoms. Here you get uh, 
the manifestations, urethritis, epididymitis can also cause prostatitis. If you're having oral sex, it causes pharyngitis. If you're having anal sex, it can cause proctitis. This is from my good friend, Caroline Abby Pop, another STI physician. Uh, and that's why um, when I borrow her slides, they're in German. Uh, in women, cervicitis, urethritis, salpingitis is fallopian tube inflammation. Uh, causing pelvic inflammatory disease, but also many other uh, manifestations. And again, transmitted in to uh, during labor to if you're infected in pregnancy. And gonorrhea itself can also be disseminated. It's actually very, very rare. It's 0.5 to 1% of patients with gonorrhea. Uh, with gonorrhea. So it is, it's rare, but it is a manifestation that you should be aware of because uh, it causes uh, um, septicemia. Uh, it can end up causing endocarditis. And so it's extremely important to, to be able to diagnose. And here it uh, manifests as forming pustules, so ne necrotic pus pustules, generally at the extrem extremities. Uh, and it is associated with specific uh, clones. So it tends to come and go in waves. Now, the problem with gonorrhea is that whilst uh, in the 1940s we had uh, penicillin came along and was highly effective, there were sulfonamide antibiotics that were used to treat uh, gonorrhea in the 1930s, but resistance to them developed extremely quickly. It, the resistance then developed to penicillins. And basically, the gonococcus Nesera gonorrhea is so good at acquiring the genes for mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance it, that it has become resistant to every single class of antibiotics that we have used for treatment. So firstly, resistance to uh, penicillins. Then we had fluoroquinolones, ciprofloxacin, the first uh, oral treatment uh, that very quickly, uh, within five years of starting to use uh, fluoroquinolones, they're no longer recommended. Uh, then the next ones, we have a cephalosporins. So third generation cephalosporins, really uh, uh, antibiotics that are used to treat, uh, sort of were used to treat complex uh, um, in-hospital infections, but very active against uh, gonorrhea until the oral uh, cephalosporin, cefixime, we have resistance and uh, it's off the recommendation list in 2012. And what we have now is we have to use keftriaxone, an injectable intramuscular injection of an antibiotic. And we use it uh, in many countries in conjunction with azithromycin. This is the only uh, treatment that is recommended by the World Health Organization worldwide because we've used up all of the rest of the antibiotics. So, an so antimicrobial resistance in gonorrhea is a real threat because if we lose, if we have high level resistance that spreads to this antibiotic combination, we will then ha have see much more uh, disseminated gonococcus probably, pelvic inflammatory disease and the severe manifestations of gonorrhea. There have been very, very highly resistant strains of, of gonorrhea. Uh, this is a tabloid newspaper in the UK called The Sun uh, with a catchy headline saying Brits called super gonorrhea and super gonorrhea is the name given to gonococcal strains that are resistant to three or more classes of existing antibiotics. These infections were in fact cured uh, by giving ertapenem, which is an antibiotic that you would reserve for the people with the most serious in hospital uh, um, infections in intensive care units. So here we a sexually transmitted infection in the community that may end up having to be treated with an antibiotic that we're trying to preserve um, for uh, severe infections. Here you can see uh, these are the polymorphonuclear leukocytes and they some of them have got uh, gonococci in them. Now th so I want to just say about these highly resistant strains, fortunately they have not spread further, meaning that whilst they do they are highly resistant, there is some kind of fitness cost to them bacterially meaning that they can't spread. So so far we haven't had widespread of these infections. Now 
I'm coming on to the newest uh, identified cause of urethritis and uh, endocervical infections called mycoplasma genitalium. It's so newly become popular that it hasn't yet developed or acquired its own name, although people tend to call it MGen for short, M genitalium. And it was actually discovered in 1980, but again, not really recognized as a cause or dealt with seriously before there were diagnostics that could identify it easily. So uh, first polymerase chain reaction test in 1990s, and really, as I said, only in the last 10 years with widely available uh, PCR has it become uh, much more recognized. So associated with male gonococcal urethritis, discovered by this man, David Taylor Robinson, uh, and has a typical flask-like shape. It's one, it's the smallest uh, uh, free living bacteria uh, that there is known and with a very small um, uh, genome, but a funny typical flask-like appearance or gourd-like appearance, which is why David Taylor Robinson appears with this, holding this uh, gourd because it looks like mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, and the reason I want to mention him is uh, not just because he's British, but because he's uh, famous for having inoculated himself in the urethra with a urea plasma, uh, a, a, um, a related organism, uh, giving himself your um, urethritis and then treating himself with antibiotics to, to prove that urethra, urea plasmas actually could cause urethritis. And here in the bottom left-hand corner is Jürgen Skov Jensen, who is now the leading authority on um, mycoplasma genitalium. The reason I'm, I went on so long about antimicrobial resistance in gonorrhea is because whilst we have only been diagnosing and treating mycoplasma genitalium for the last 10 years, it has developed uh, resistance extremely quickly to this antibiotic azithromycin. And a probable reason is that we used azithromycin so widely to treat chlamydia infections that we diagnosed and we inadequately treated mycoplasma genitalium infections that were, that were there at the same time. So we're treating all men with non-gonococcal urethritis such that uh, resistance emerged. And resistance emerges with azithromycin in mycoplasma genitalium during treatment. So you can start with a sensitive strain. And by the time you have finished your treatment and come back, you have developed resistance. So this is another uh, infection for which we are extremely worried about the development of antimicrobial resistance. And we're having to use new treatments and develop new treatments. So happening across uh, all parts of the world. How do these uh, infections compare? So in the general population, if you take a sample of the general population and you do a, this actually comes from urine samples uh, from women and men in different age groups in randomly, randomly selected in the general population, you can see actually these three infections, they cause very similar syndromes, but they have very different levels of prevalence. So chlamydia is the most common, followed by mycoplasma genitalium, and followed by gonorrhea. Now, why is gonorrhea so much uh, less common than the other two? Probably because its uh, duration of natural infection is much shorter than that of chlamydia and gonorrhea. Chlamydia and gonorrhea persist uh, untreated for a, an average of around a year and can persist for even longer. So they can persist undetected and then are detected uh, in asymptomatic people in the general population. What you can see here is in women aged 16 to 19 is that they have the highest prevalence of these infections uh, going down with age, whereas in men, uh, fewer infections in the young, in teenage uh, young men, most common in 20 to 24 year olds, and then going down. And the usual reason attributed to this is that uh, the young women tend, are more likely to have older male sexual partners than are young men. Young men tend to have uh, sex with young women of their own age, as I pointed out earlier. 
But if you look at surveillance data, so these are what we collect in Switzerland about diagnosed infections, you have to be very careful about the surveillance data. These are only finding infections when someone has been tested. And there's an important difference that you'll see now between chlamydia on the left and gonorrhea on the right, such that, uh, so we've got an increasing uh, number of newly diagnosed chlamydia cases, much more common in women than in men. But this does not mean that chlamydia is more common in women than the men. As you can see from this graph, if it turns out that on average, if you average across all ages, the prevalence of infections in women and men is the same. Why do we have more infections here in surveillance data? It's because we test more women than men, because we know that women can have asymptomatic infections. So we're more concerned about identifying asymptomatic infections and we tend to wait for men until they have symptoms. On the other hand, you see the opposite pattern for gonorrhea, way, way more infections in men than in women. This is going up as well. Part of this curve is going up also because of more frequent testing, but part of it is going up because of increased transmission and it particularly increasing transmission amongst men who have sex with men. So we're putting together this information that we've accumulated so far. Men who have sex with men have higher levels of gonorrhea than uh, men who have sex with women only. Uh, gonorrhea has a shorter uh, 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 duration of infection, but can be uh, caught again more quickly than once you've treated it. And it is more likely to be symptomatic in men. So we're going to, to detect it and treat it more in men than in women. So keep an eye out when you look at surveillance data, do not assume that the, that represents all infections. It's only those that are being detected. Think like an epidemiologist. So let's move on. Let's talk about the STIs that present as ulcers. Here's the list, herpes simplex, syphilis, lymphogranuloma venereum, and chancroid. I'm not going to talk about these last two because they're incredibly uncommon, but just so that you know, lymphogranuloma is also caused by chlamydia trachomatis, but by different serovars than the ones that cause the genital strain. Syphilis, the probably the most famous um, sexually transmitted infection of all because it's the... Uh, first recognized and used to be incredibly fatal. So all of these men uh, in history are thought to have had uh, syphilis. Henry VIII, King of England, composer Beethoven, artist Van Gogh, president of the USA, Abraham Lincoln, and including Adolf Hitler, all of whom are widely said to have had um, syphilis and most of them not treated for it. What, syph the, what ulcers does syphilis cause? Syphilis actually, you know, it has uh, multiple stages. I said it's systemic, but in its very early primary stage, it presents with ulcers and it presents with ulcers anywhere that you have sex with someone who is infected. So you have uh, sex, uh, you have ulcers occurring with penetrative sex from someone uh, who probably has an asymptomatic ulcer uh, on the um, here on the vulva. Uh, here, if you have oral sex, you can get it on the lips. Uh, and if you have oral sex, this would be with someone who then uh, has uh, secondary syphilis. So now has systemic syphilis uh, and is highly infectious. So the treponemes that cause it are coming out uh, in the saliva. So then if you have oral sex uh, or if you suck someone's nipples, then you can get shankers, what these typical ulcers are called shankers, you can get those on the, on the nipple. So you can get them at any uh, place on the body. So when you have someone, it means that when you're doing your physical examination of someone presenting to an STI clinic, you should actually examine the whole body, not just the gentle area. Treatment for syphilis, miraculously, given what I've told you about antimicrobial resistance in uh, gonorrhea and in mycoplasma genitalium, syphilis is still entirely susceptible to penicillin. So injectable penicillin is the treatment of choice for uh, 
syphilis. And it is the treatment of choice, despite the fact that it is injectable, because it crosses the blood brain barrier. And syphilis, uh, if it is untreated, causes systemic infection, gets into the central nervous system and into the cardiovascular system. And to treat a systemic tertiary syphilis, you need to have an antibiotic that penetrates the blood brain barrier. So here, uh, another of Caroline's um, slides, benzathine penicillin uh, intramuscularly, and the dose, the depending on the stage of syphilis that you have, you'll give more uh, syphilis. So, and if you have neurosyphilis, 14 days of intravenous therapy. Just a minor diversion on this uh, that I was in China a couple of years ago and visited the largest STD clinic in, uh, uh, in the world in Shanghai. They have a ward for people with tertiary syphilis and I saw people with the neurological com co uh, complications of syphilis uh, and ocular syphilis and uh, uh, syphilis in the, in the ear, deafness from syphilis all being treated with uh, intravenous uh, penicillin. So links now between infections. Syphilis, as I showed you, was, is more common in men who have sex with men. And in high income countries like Switzerland, uh, syphilis is more common, so more common in men who have sex with men and much more common in men who have sex with men than in uh, those uh, with HIV than those who are uninfected with HIV. So we have a kind of epidemic within an epidemic where most of the syphilis is actually occurring in a small, smaller group than just MSM. It's occurring amongst those who uh, are men who have sex with men uh, who have HIV. Here is where assortative mixing uh, is important because it means that it's men who have sex with men who have HIV infection are likely choosing infected partners so that they do not transmit uh, HIV to uh, MSM who are not HIV infected. But what we know, and so I'm showing you on this graph on the right, uh, it's the red curve that is the early syphilis. But you can see that gonorrhea and chlamydia have increased too, whilst a HIV infection has increased but then stayed reasonably stable. At the very right hand part, uh, we see uh, on this graph, we, we see treat widespread antiretroviral therapy, which we know suppresses viral replication recommended for people as soon as they are diagnosed with HIV. So when their HIV is suppressed, their viral load is suppressed, viral load in blood and viral load in semen is also suppressed, meaning that if you have HIV and you're on antiretroviral treatment, you're actually uh, not, cannot transmit HIV to your sex partners, meaning that you can start to have uh, sex with uninfected uh, men without the fear of passing on HIV. What is also now available is what's called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. These are antiretroviral drugs given uh, to men who have sex with men or anyone who's at high risk uh, of HIV and prevents you from acquiring HIV. And the combination of having uh, antiretroviral therapy that is highly efficacious in preventing transmission and the ability now to prevent people from, from getting HIV infected is that you have more mixing between men who have sex with men who have HIV and don't have HIV. And you have spread from assortative mixing into the larger population of MSM. And because antiretrovirals don't protect you against syphilis or any of these other infections, we're seeing increases in these other bacterial infections. So you can consider infections alone, but you've also got to consider the links between them. Right, now in the last, I'm, pro I'm going to run over by carrying on talking about for another five minutes or so. We're carrying on with um, infections that cause ulcers. And the most common sexually transmitted infection worldwide is herpes simplex infection. 
HS, herpes simplex infection type 2. The reason that it is the most common worldwide is because once you have it, it's a viral infection, you do not get rid of it. So you have many people who have acquired herpes and remain infected uh, for life. And if you test them, they will have antibodies to herpes simplex infection. And actually, what you can see here is in this, these estimates worldwide, uh, it's estimated that getting on for half a million people have had and carry HSV2 infection. If you add that to the 376 million uh, of in new infections from curable STIs worldwide, uh, you know, the STIs are really, really common. Uh, so a bit, that's a billion people either with uh, an STI that they carry uh, for life or that they acquire newly, newly sometime during the year. Now, herpes uh, simplex is it's a herpes virus and like all herpes viruses, including uh, chickenpox, it's an infection that causes, in primary infection, it's a systemic infection. Uh, it causes fever, causes muscle aches, viral symptoms. And after the primary infection, it becomes latent. It becomes latent. It goes for, it travels, the viral particles go along the sensory nerves and it remains latent in dorsal root ganglia, not causing any symptoms, not doing anything at all, until it gets reactivated for some reason and then travels back out along the nerves and then causes eruptions in the place that was initially infected. So if you have genital herpes simplex infection, uh, in, in, which is supplied by your sacral nerve, then you get blisters on the sacral nerve distribution, it becomes latent, you will have reactivations, and then it causes ulcers uh, somewhere else in the somewhere in the sacral nerve distribution. What I wanted to show you here is that the the ulcers, the appearance actually changes. So when it first erupts, they're they, these little vesicles, these little blisters with clear fluid inside, which are highly infectious. Then they break open and they call these, cause these very shallow, very, very painful ulcers. Uh, and then these uh, just uh, over time, over the course of a few days, will heal up and cause scabs or slough off. Uh, and then they just disappear completely. What do you do when you see someone who has primary herpes infection? Uh, you treat them with um, an acyclovir or acyclovir derivative, valacyclovir, a week for, for um, twice daily for a week. But you have to catch it early. Otherwise, you don't manage to reduce the shedding or shorten the duration of the infection very much. If people have very frequent re recurrences, you can give them treatment when they have a recurrence, although these recurrences actually uh, go away on their own and they're more of an inconvenience that they they're not they don't tend to be as painful uh, and they don't cause systemic symptoms but if you have people who are having very very frequently recurrent genital herpes you can put people on suppressive treatment and this antiviral valacyclovir is incredibly uh, uh, successful given once a day in actually suppressing uh, eruptions and recurrences of herpes simplex but most actually, most primary uh, infections with syphilis probably also don't get recognized. So another uh, asymptomatic uh, STI and most herpes is first recognized when someone is having a recurrence that they notice for the first time. Now, genital herpes uh, or, or herpes simplex viruses, you know that there is not just herpes simplex type 2. There is also herpes simplex virus type 1 that causes cold sores, which are very, very common. And children get them by spreading around and just by being in close contact with, with each other, meaning that there are a lot of people who have cold sores and carry cold sores and get recurrent cold sores. Now, why is that relevant to genital herpes? It turns out that herpes simplex type 1 is now the most common cause of genital herpes. So when we talk about genital herpes, we can't assume that it's herpes uh, simplex type 2. So we have people having oral sex 
uh, and transferring their herpes simplex type 1 to someone's genitals. And then, so here you can see the shallow ulcers on uh, the vulva outlined here. And then, of course, you can transmit your herpes simplex type 1 through penetrative uh, penile vaginal sexual intercourse or, or anal sex. Uh, and I'm showing you this here along this graph. So amongst the youngest age group is the group amongst whom the proportion of herpes caused that is caused by herpes simplex uh, type 1 is the highest. And that is because it is the younger age groups that are most likely to be having uh, oral sex. And in this figure here, taken from successive um, sex behavior uh, surveys, asking whether people have given or received oral sex, those in the oldest age group have about 60% of them say that they have had, born in um, 1936, 1945, have had oral sex. But in those who are in the younger age groups, it has increased to 80 to 90% are having oral sex. So this is why uh, herpes simplex type 1 is now the most common cause of genital herpes recurrences. Now, uh, the, I want to just talk about uh, STIs that cause lumps and itches because it addresses one of the issues that came up also um, that I was asked to talk about was how to tell the difference between an ingrowing uh, pubic hair and genital warts, which comes to an interesting story, which also brings in pubic lice. So the story is, goes that these are genital warts. They, they have man, many, many dis, uh, manifestations. So perfectly natural to, to want to know whether they can be mixed up with uh, ingrowing hairs that cause lumps as well. So here are some penile warts. Here are some anal warts. Uh, you have vulva warts, vaginal warts, uh, and they can be they can just occur singly as well. Um, here in this picture are uh, ac these are ingrowing um, uh, pubic hairs. And the difference here is that ingrowing pubic hairs tend to cause much more inflammation uh, because actually they are caused by the irritation that the pubic hair causes by growing into, into the follicle. Uh, and then you get sort of secondary bacterial infections. So you can get uh, pus in them as well. And the, re the way that you tell the difference is that genital warts are not associated with hair follicles, whereas these uh, are you should see a hair follicle or the hair or where the hair was uh, you are so associated with these little um, eruptions here. The connection with pubic lice is that what I realized is that these days it is very, very common for women to shave their pubic hair and so that they, when, then when the hair, hair grows again, then you get ingrown pubic hairs. But pubic lice are lice that uh, attached to pubic hairs and used to be very, very common as cause of as a cause of itch that we used to see in the in the genital urinary medicine clinic. But when waxing became and shaving became much more common, and typically the Brazilian, uh, the most extreme form of waxing all of your pubic hair off, uh, we saw in clinics very, very many fewer episodes of pubic lice. So it is possible that this change in behavior has uh, actually caught, you know, resulted in the near elimination of one of our sexually transmitted pathogens. Human papillomavirus, warts are caused by human papillomavirus. Uh, these are extremely common too. 80% of a sexually active population will have had uh, a human papillomavirus at some time, but most people just get rid of it on their own. If it is persistent, it can cause cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Now, these genital warts are caused by human papillomaviruses type 6 and 11. They are not the ones that cause cervical cancer. Those are caused mainly by the types 16 to 18. But we have vaccines now that can prevent all of these types of human papillomavirus. And since we have had human papillomavirus um, uh, vaccinations, 
we have managed to almost eradicate genital warts. So actually, uh, in young, in teenagers and uh, and people. People, those who will become sexually active now, you're actually incredibly and unlikely to see genital warts if they've been vaccinated uh, against human papillomavirus infection. But it also uh, reduces the prevalence of these other high risk HPV types that are associated with cervical cancer. So we are having an impact now on the incidence of cervical cancer. So it's a, a cancer that is sexually transmitted that we can prevent with a vaccination. I just very briefly wanted to mention uh, HIV because uh, whilst it is the most fatal of sexually transmitted infections, we, we, the number of new infections has decreased enormously now and even and has gone actually now down even is going down even further probably because of PrEP, this pre-exposure prophylaxis, that in the group that is at a highest risk of HIV, men who have sex with men, uh, we're actually preventing them from catching it, even when they're having condomless sex with HIV infected people. Uh, and the age groups most affected are those uh, actually uh, in the 25 to um, 34 year old age group, not uh, the youngest MSM, M more likely to have newly diagnosed infection, the older you get. So the last thing I want to talk about is about some principles about control. How do we control STIs? We want to promote sexual healthy behavior. We want to promote condoms. Uh, we want to treat and we want to provide access to medicines and appropriate uh, preventive measures. The condom promotion campaigns for HIV in the 1980s were extremely successful uh, in Switzerland and in the UK. And actually, they resulted in massive uh, reductions. We weren't able to see reductions in HIV at the time. But what we did see is in these other sexually transmitted infections, this is primary prevention. This is a fear of AIDS and use of condoms that is reducing uh, all of these other sexually transmitted infections as well. We can apply prevention at the individual level. This would be something like a vaccination. At a partnership level, this would be something like doing contact tracing. Uh, and at a network level, this would involve doing contact tracing more widely uh, in a sexual network. And at the population level, this is by doing mass campaigns and uh, interventions at the population level. But when you are trying to prevent infections or treat infections at the clinical level, what you are seeing is actually only a very, very small minority of infections. So if you're a clinician, because most of these infections are actually asymptomatic, you are seeing a small proportion of them. And the proportion that actually gets treated and their partner gets treated is actually a very small proportion of all infections, which is generally why they carry on being transmitted. Just let me just give one uh, slide about STIs and COVID. These are from uh, our Swiss surveillance system and showing that uh, for these are um, gonorrhea diagnosis in the solid black line. And here you can see this is when the lockdown heard, uh, occurred and then when the lockdown was released, diagnoses of uh, gonorrhea went down. What is really hard to know is you don't know these are diagnosed infections, this is surveillance data. But because people were had to stay at home, then we are also, there is also some evidence that actual transmission was reduced. People report having fewer sexual partners uh, during the, the COVID uh, pandemic. But with the release of measures, they are uh, able to visit clinics again and have sex again uh, and diagnosis and probably incidence uh, goes up as well. As the number of visitors goes up, then the numbers of diagnoses go up. Uh, this is showing you again the impact of HPV vaccination on preventing genital warts. And this is that was about antenatal syphilis screening prevents congenital syphilis. So the last uh, in 
at the international level, the World Health Organization has a strategies that should be applied, uh, able to be applied worldwide. Uh, and the World Health Organization is a group that I'm uh, also involved in, in the STI estimates and giving advice about guidelines, management guidelines for STIs. So I want to finish here by saying that you talked very eloquently at the beginning about STIs being stigmatized. We should not feel that they are stigmatized. Here is me at an STI conference being the face of, uh, of chlamydia. This is chlamydia. is my friend, Caroline Cameron, the face of syphilis. Uh, and if you want to, we, the aim of this conference, the aim of our organization, the International Society for STD Research, is to stop stigma that is associated with STIs. Uh, and a book that I highly recommend to you by Ina Park has just been published, uh, Strange uh, Bedfellows, her personal stories about uh, STIs, treating STIs and reducing stigma. So with that, I'm going to finish. I'm sorry that I talked for so long, but I hope we have time for some questions. Thank you very much, Professor Lowe. That was very interesting and an important message towards the end. So let's keep this in mind. Um, I'd just like to remind all participants that if you're joining on YouTube, you can go also to the Zoom webinar if you have some additional questions to ask. Um, and we'd like to start direct, directly with some questions from the crowd. Caroline, my colleague, will take over. Thank you very much, Professor Lowe, for this very interesting presentation. Um, I will start with a question um, to your last topic you talked about, about the stigma. Um, and it is also uh, mentioned in the description of this um, presentation that, um, and I think we all experience this also a lot, that S STIs are still a big taboo in our society. And my question is now, how does this taboo affect your research? So is it even possible to do a, a valid uh, epidemiologic, epidemiologic research when nobody is, is talking honestly uh, about the subject? Okay, that's a really, really good question. So yes, sexually transmitted infections are taboo. Uh, it makes it very, very difficult to actually get funding for uh, STI research. So that was the reason for our face of an STI campaign. It arose from uh, someone saying in a research talk that there are people who are happy to be the face of, of uh, even you know cancer to get raise money for cancer or heart disease but no one wants to be the face of gonorrhea so we uh, want to publicize this to reduce stigma what you can do um valid epidemiological studies first of all you as researchers you have to be and as clinicians we have to be trained uh, and we have to train ourselves to have be completely non-judgmental when we talk to people. The way that you ask questions, the way that you make feel, someone feel comfortable, the way you ask them about their sexual behavior and symptoms that they have, you have to behave in a very non-judgmental manner. When you are publicizing these uh, um, the studies that you want to do, it depends on the type of study. So if it was about... Um, uh, for example, a treatment for gonorrhea and you have a threat of antimicrobial resistance, people with gonorrhea genuinely want to be treated. So they are likely to enroll in these studies and you do studies with very, very high um, uptake. The kind of study that's more difficult to do is maybe this kind of study that you would do uh, about sexual behavior, the one I showed you about oral sex and asking people about whether they'd had oral sex. Absolutely, those are very, very difficult to do. What you need is you need to have very, very good communication. You need to have very good reasons for doing it so that the population, the people understand why you're doing it. Uh, it takes time, it takes a lot of investment, and you probably don't get as good uptake as you do with uh, some other studies, but you can get valid results. What you can do is what has developed over time, moved away from doing face-to-face -face interviews and writing down what people say, is to giving people computers and they just enter the 
computer on their own. They're doing it completely confidentially. They transmit their, uh, their answers electronically. And actually, you can when you compare with pen and paper results, you show that they report more sexual partners, they report more risky sexual behaviours, not because they're having those, but because we think that they're able to talk about them more, more honestly. So it's going to take time. And you're the generation who's going to reduce stigma for us even more. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> um, we have a question from the crowd. Is the discharge, e.g., of a woman with chlamydia transmissive? If yes, is, the, is there just too little direct contact in order to be transmitted onto another woman? Okay, so it's so if you're a woman and you have the infection in your endocervix and it's causing a discharge, that discharge will come out through the vagina and will come towards the external introitus. So yes, the when you have the infection, when it's replicating in your endocervix, the discharge in, uh, contains chlamydial bodies that can be transmitted to someone else. So you can transmit them if you are a woman having sex with, with women. But it, there is less uh, what you can get on your fingers and then put inside another woman's vagina is less than if you're a man and you have a urethra that's full of replicating uh, chlamydia and then you ejaculate and then the amount of chlamydia that gets to into the endocervix is much higher than it is if you are transferring it indirectly from, from cervix to cervix. So women do get chlamydia from sex between women uh, but it is much less common than it is from man to woman. Thank you. I have um, two questions in the chat about uh, herpes. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is, can herpes simplex be transmitted when there aren't any symptoms visible? Uh, yes, it can be. Now, what is difficult to know is whether it did not cause sores or whether the sores that it caused were not recognized and were not painful enough. What can happen, what can, can happen, you, you can show, if you, if you take uh, people who have herpes simplex virus and you ask them to swab themselves uh, every hour, this, is, this study has been done, okay? Uh, and then you do PCR on those swabs, you can show that there is herpes virus coming out and being shed uh, at different times of day and being shed even when people don't have uh, actual outbreaks. Usually there isn't enough, but sometimes there is a blip that just you just happen to be having sex, the blip is there, someone may not have a, a sore at the time, uh, and it can be transmitted. But mostly it is transmitted when people actually have an outbreak. A lot of people who have herpes have kind of, they have prodromal symptoms, meaning that before the actual sores are visible, they can have parasthesia. This, this is because it's in the sacral nerves, in the dorsal nerves. So they feel some kind of tingling, they feel something that's not quite right. So even if they don't have sores, then they have some kind of feeling that they're going to develop sores. And then if you stop having sex when you have that kind of symptom, you're less likely to, to transmit it. And also, again, if you're a woman, if you, you know, you could, your, your cervix is, uh, is supplied by your sacral nerve. So you could actually have an ulcer on your cervix that you could transmit uh, during sex, but you wouldn't know that you had a, a, a sore. You would have a sore, but you just wouldn't know about it. Okay, thank you very much for this explanation. Another question uh, from the chat. Can you just give a quick overview again on the main differences between herpes type one versus herpes type two? Yep. They are essentially the same virus, but they have a different, uh, uh, natural tropism. That means that HSV1, herpes simplex virus type 1 that causes cold sores, tends to, prefers to live in the cervical ganglia that supply your mouth. And HSV type 2 prefers to live in the, do in the dorsal root ganglia that supply the sacral nerve. Uh, but you can see, can clearly see that you can have one that 
uh, can infect the other site. The, if you have genital herpes that is caused by herpes simplex type 1, it turns out that if you follow these people over time, those who've got the cold sore virus as genital herpes tend to have fewer recurrences. And those recurrences tend to kind of wear off over time. So that's probably an indication that actually, whilst it can cause gentle herpes, it, herpes simplex virus type 1 prefers to live uh, in, uh, in, in your mouth. So it lasts less long and causes fewer and less frequent recurrences than the herpes simplex type 2. And we have a question that fits in beautifully with this one. What do people with cold sore have to pay attention to? Is oral sex without active cold sore okay? Do they need to practice safe sex while having an active cold sore? So again, it's the same as with uh, genital herpes. If you have a cold sore and you have tingling before it erupts, then you should stop having oral sex or actual um, uh, mouth kissing as soon as you have uh, as soon as you um, feel, feel it coming. I, I would not say I mean it, ideally to prevent uh, transmission then you would use a dental dam every time that you kiss but I think that it's just impractical to do that. What is also true is that a proportion of people already have cold sores and uh, have antibodies to cold sore virus and have never had a symptom. So they'll actually be protected against, against them and won't get it. And we just don't know. So I think you've got to be reasonable and sensible about it. It's again about talking to your partners. You should say, if you know that you have cold sores, you want to tell your partner, I do have cold sores. I might give them to you when we kiss. I'll tell you as soon as I, I, as I have one. In the same way, if you have, know that you have genital herpes, then you would tell your partner uh, before you start having sex that you, are, um, that you have herpes. You, ideally, you would also use condoms with all of your sexual partners. But actually, because you don't usually put the condom on until uh, the man has an erection and you can you can get genital herpes uh, without having to have penetrative sex you can of course transmit uh, genital herpes without having penetrative sex so you can't prevent it all of it with with condoms either so i think this is again about the stigma and it's about being honest and it's about talking to your partners and then if if the infection does happen hopefully you will then you know, when you recognize symptoms then that would alert you to go and get treatment quickly and that at least you will be able to get a treatment that will shorten the, the primary infection that you're going to have but you can't prevent transmission completely okay i think uh, it seems like this topic is very interesting for our <laughs> participants because we have now another question if chlamydia can be tr uh, transmitted before becoming symptomatic and if you would recommend the ST STI test even if you don't have any symptoms and didn't engage in any unsafe situation. Okay, so because chlamydia is mainly asymptomatic, usually does not cause uh, any symptoms. And as you saw in a woman, if you had symptoms, you wouldn't see them because they're occurring at the endocervix. So you can transmit chlamydia without having symptoms that we know. If you are a woman and you had a vaginal discharge, there's basically no way that you would know that that was chlamydia versus physiological versus anything else. So essentially, if you're a woman, you can most of that transmission is occurring without, certainly without knowing that you have chlamydia, even if you have a symptom, it's going to be non-specific. Non so yes, you can transmit it without having symptoms. What I would recommend is that, uh, so, okay, so if you have never had uh, condomless uh, sex, penetrative sex, it is highly unlikely that you would have uh, caught chlamydia from anyone. But if you have ha ever had condomless sex and you have a new sexual partner, once again, you want to talk to your partner about whether you've ever been diagnosed as having a, a sexually transmitted infection. 
a good idea to is to the both of you go and have tests for STIs before you decide to start having sex. And if you're going to have sex before you've been tested, then you use a condom before you uh, go and get tested and you use the condom all the way through penetration, not just at the bit where you feel that you're going to come. So you if you have never been in a risky situation, I would not, I don't think you would need to have a test for chlamydia. I think it's unlikely. But if you have been in that situation, because chlamydia can persist for a year or more without symptoms, if you had one partner, you haven't had any symptoms, but you're you have a new partner and you want to have start having sex, I would go and be tested, both of you, at the same time. Those tests are not going to diagnose all infections. You will be able to diagnose chlamydia, and gonorrhea. You will be offered a test for HIV and maybe for hepatitis, uh, but you're not going to diagnose herpes because you, because you can't diagnose it if you haven't got uh, it actively and the antibody test isn't worth doing. And HPV, you should all be vaccinated now. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, need to be tested. You, and there's no way of testing for HPV. So you have, you will be tested for a limited, you need to know what you're being tested for and what you're not being tested for. And syphilis you can test for. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting response. Just the last question, because we're running out of time. You mentioned that chlamydia is your favorite STI. <laughs> Why is that in just a really brief answer? Okay, it's because uh, when I uh, went to, uh, I, I, I just really, really got involved in it. When I, when I was working in an STI clinic uh, in the 1980s, early 1990s, it's just when we got these tests where we were able to test widely. So we were diagnosing much more of it. Then I got involved in a project which was trying to look at how effective chlamydia screening was. So we did a widespread prevalence survey in the UK. And then I just got in. The more I found out about it, the more I found that there were unanswered questions about it. And they just, these questions just keep on coming and we haven't solved them all yet. So we need to keep on doing research about chlamydia. Thank you very much. I think that's a great message towards the end. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lowe, for participating in our, uh, in our program today. Thank you for having invited me. I hope that you will, some of you will decide to do STIs as a career, do electives. If you want to get in touch with me, then I'm happy to uh, reply to you. Thank and I you. congratulate you. you for doing a conference on sexual health and stigma. <laughs> yes. Thank you, so, Thanks a lot. Bye now. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Okay, we'll be proceeding. Um, after our lecture with a more interactive part of this uh, SMSC. So the next thing happening will be the project fair on Wonderme. Wonderme is a website my friend Kilian will explain you more about. And the project fair is an opportunity for you to interact in a more personal manner and to get a deeper insight into the swims of projects that have been presented in the morning. To get to, uh, to get to know more information regarding this project fair, just stay in the stream and my friend Kilian will explain you everything. Hi, I'm Kilian and I shortly explain how to use WonderMe for the project fair. Um, firstly, what exactly is the project fair? Um, it is a chance to meet and interact with the swims projects you saw at the project presentations. You can ask there some questions and you have the chance to meet people who are involved in these projects. For that we use Wonder, but what exactly is Wonder? Wonder is a virtual space on the internet where people can meet and talk. No worry, it's not very complicated and I'll explain how it works. But firstly, how do I get on the, our Wonder Room? For that, you um, can go to our website smscbasel2021.ch then on the program um, project fair you have to click on this orange button and if you and if you click on this orange button the wonder room opens um, please take notice that wonder is only working on google chrome um, yes so if you are in on the wonder room 
Um, every one of you has one avatar. This avatar, this is myself. If I want to move this avatar, I have to click with the cursor somewhere and click and my avatar follows. You don't need to drag it anyhow or do something else. Just click and hold and the avatar follows this direction. <clears throat> if I want to have a conversation with someone, I need to have a conversation partner. Um, there is someone, so I go near him. And if I'm close enough to him, um, so now he is um, not near me. So if I'm near him, um, <laughs> uh, uh, Buffer is gonna fall. <laughs> and, and now we. <laughs> Thema, du bist so ein Idiot. <laughs> uh, so if when we're close enough, a bubble is gonna form and uh, we ha can have a conversation. If you want to end the conversation, you can go out of the bubble and the conversation is over. Um, so I've, oh, there is also a chat function um, on the side of the window there. You have to click on this bubble. And there you have the chance to chat with everyone or just with someone privately or with the person in the circle you are in. Yes, so I think these are the most important things you have to know about Wonder. Now, I want to explain how the project fair is going to take place exactly. Um, every project has one room area. Um, in, the, in this room area, um, one project leader is waiting for you and you can go to them and build a bubble and you can um, interact with them. Um, take note that a maximum of 15 people can be in one bubble. Um, and this, this is the whole idea of the project fair. Um, one thing um, before you get on the Wonder Room, you have to accept microphone and the camera. And you will be asked one question, uh, which languages you speak. S because if you go over one avatar, um, you know the languages the other person speaks and you can avoid the French. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, take it as a chance. Um, yes, so I think this is it. Um, if you want to watch the video again, you can find it on the website and uh, under Project Fair. Um, remember that Wonder is already working on Google Chrome and then uh, see ya. Thank you, Kilian, for this uh, kind introduction. So Kilian and the projects are expecting you on WonderMe. We'll all rejoin together at the workshops at 17.45 for the closing ceremony and a surprise you should not miss. This will be taking place in stream, two, in stream one. Stream two will be terminated soon. To enter Wonder, Wonder Me, you can either click on the link in the chat, scan the QR code or go on our website. Thank you very much.